Okay, and then I'm going to share the screen with the, um, with the presentation so, deck. Emma, Valerie, uh, could you please switch off your camera? So yep. it's Maria, the first one. Okay. Yeah, so, Maria and Emma on the screen. Yeah. I can stay here because I will also give the introduction, okay. right? Until, yeah, 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 you can stay. One moment because I cannot find now the document uh, while sharing. Can you see my screen now? No? No. Now should be working. Yes, it will. Yes. Yeah, that's it. Okay, let me put in presentation mode. Now we can start the, um, the webinar. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And let's go. So do I start with speaking, Maria? Yeah. Or Okay. Or, um, uh, yep, that's good. Okay. Maybe we start in a minute, Maria. I see there yeah, are still participants great. coming in. Yeah, I think all participants are joining, so it takes yes. a couple of minutes. It takes a couple of minutes indeed, like the number is still increasing. increasing. Okay, so I think I will maybe slowly start. Uh, okay, that's fine. that would be okay? great. Yes. Okay, good morning and good afternoon to everybody. So participants are still joining the meeting, but we have a packed agenda, so let's, uh, let's kick off. Uh, a very warm welcome to this webinar, The Future of Proteins. Um, so my name is Emma Sitchwick. I work for Flanders Food, the innovation platform for the agri-food industry, and together uh, with uh, my colleague Maria from Food Mazi, uh, the innovation platform also for this uh, agri-food industry in Spain, and I'm working for Flanders, Belgium. We have organized uh, this workshop in the context of the Global Future Project. And maybe uh, before I uh, quickly introduce the project in a couple of words, I want to thank uh, especially Tracy Saw of Enterprise Singapore and Sen Yong uh, Spark from Park from uh, Food Police for their support, because without them, uh, we would not have managed to put together such a nice uh, agenda uh, today. Uh, just one uh, sentence, a couple of sentences on the Global Future Project. This project is a COSME funded project and it, uh, it's all about establishing cooperation between uh, innovative uh, front runners, um, SMEs, startups, scale-ups uh, uh, from Europe and from Asia. Um, 
that are really uh, with their innovations uh, having a positive impact on a sustainability transition uh, of the agri-food system. So the, the, the project really want to kind of foster and facilitate cooperation uh, between uh, SMEs from Europe and Asia in that domain. Um, and this webinar is part of a series of webinars, and these series um, are actually a means to getting to know each other, um, are a means to kind of uh, spotting first collaboration opportunities. And today we focus indeed on the future of proteins, more precisely on uh, fermentation derived proteins and on cultivated meat and the innovations, the cutting edge at cutting edge innovations we see nowadays uh, in Europe and Asia. Um, so I think that's it for the introduction. Um, I think on the next slide we see um, the company presentations that are lined up today. We are really, really happy that these speakers confirmed uh, to speak today. Uh, we have uh, SME startups from Europe, we have one from Singapore, and in the field of cultivated meat, we're really happy that we have uh, three South Korean uh, startups companies presenting today, which is really, really great. Prior to uh, giving the stage to these uh, companies, we have two keynote speakers. Uh, during these presentations, uh, they will set the scene uh, of this webinar. So we have Valerie Pang from the Good uh, Food Institute Asia Pacific, who will uh, provide us with insights uh, into what is happening in the domain of alternative proteins in Singapore. And subsequently, we have uh, Daniel uh, de la Puente, and he will um, explain us what is happening in the Like a Pro uh, project. I think uh, one of the biggest uh, ever funded projects by the European Commission on uh, alternative proteins. So I don't know, Maria, whether I forgot something. I think I think it's I think you made everything quite clear. Yes. Uh, before starting, <laughs> I would like just to share with the audience uh, some practicalities. Uh, as Selma told you, the the agenda is quite packed, so we have a limited time to go through through the whole topics. Uh, for this reason, we we created a, a dedicated session uh, for Q and A just at the at the end of the webinar. Uh, if you have any question. Uh, along the webinar, you should put, uh, you should place your your questions in the dedicated box you can find uh, at the bottom of your screen. It's quite close to the to the chat function, so please feel free to to ask uh, whatever you, you you need. And I think it's, it's time to start with the with the agenda. Maybe we can start with our keynote speakers. Uh, Valeria, I don't know if you if you're ready. Maybe you can start with with the global overview about the alternative proteins. Yes. Okay. Sure. So I will share my screen uh, right now. All right. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, Valeria um, is working. Okay. I put it in slideshow mode. So let me Perfect. know if it's okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So hello, everyone. Um, really happy to be here to give a speech to you guys today. And I'm going to be talking about an introduction to Singapore's alternative protein ecosystem. Um, and I'm Valerie Pang. I'm the Innovation Associate at GFI APAC. So first, I just give you a brief background about what uh, Good Food Institute APAC is. So um, GFI is an international network of nonprofits that is supporting the alternative protein industry. Um, we are located in, you know, we have many different offices around the world in the US, Brazil, Europe, Israel, India, and a partner organization in China. And over here, we are the APAC office that is based in Singapore. So across all the offices at GFI, we work on three areas to support the alternative protein industry. One is policy, where we're working with policy actors to secure support for R&D um, and make regulation more friendly for alternative proteins. We have the corporate engagement department that's working with companies and investors to unlock funds and innovate and scale up their companies. And then we have the science and tech um, pillar that is advancing uh, open access research into alternative proteins. So these are the three main areas that we support this industry. So now I will go into talking about what is the alternative protein landscape in Asia Pacific, and then I will focus a bit on Singapore. So alternative proteins, there are largely three categories of all proteins. There is plant-based meat, um, cultivated meat, and fermentation-derived proteins. Um, fermentation-derived proteins can also be known as SCP, single-cell protein. Um, at GFI, we like to call it fermentation-derived proteins, but 
essentially it is the same thing. And then for cultivated, it can also be known as um, cultured meat, cell-based meat, lab-grown meat. Um, at GFI, we like to standardize the terminology and call it cultivated meat. Um, so just in case there's any confusion about the terminology there. And so for plant-based meat, um, it's basically like meat, eggs, and dairy that's produced directly from the plants. So essentially, it uh, has like protein, fat, vitamins, minerals, and water, and it tastes just like meat, um, just that it is not actually meat itself. Um, and there are some APEC plant-based startups and brands. So there is kind of Growthwell and Tyndall and Green Monday. Um, Growthwell and Tyndall are headquartered in Singapore. Green Monday is from Hong Kong. Um, and then we also have some international, um, we have some com uh, big CPG companies like CP Foods and Thai Union, and they have also created um, their own meat substitutes like Meat Zero and OMG Meat. Um, so that's how like the bigger companies are also creating their own plant-based meat alternatives. So this is just, a, just some examples, not all of the companies. Um, and I'll go next into cultivated meat, which is kind of the focus, um, as well as fermentation. So for cultivated meat, it is produced from animal cells. Um, it, the meat cultivation is kind of similar to what happens in the animal, except that it is grown in a lab and you provide cells with the warmth and basic nutrients required to build muscle and fat. And so this is just an overview of the APEC cultivated landscape of some of the companies in this region. Um, you can see that you know over the years, from 2017 up till now, there have been many companies like, that appear every single year, and they work on all different kinds of cultivated meat. And just to give an exam uh, some examples of the cultivated meat companies in Singapore, um, we have Good Meat, which is from Eat Just, and they have been selling um, cultivated chicken in Singapore. And then we have shook meats that creates shrimp. And then we have umami meats that creates fish. As of now, the one that is available for sale is by Good Meat. But I think in the next few years, um, the other companies will also get their regulatory approval to sell their products as well. Next, we have the fermentation um, derived proteins. It's an enabling technology for the alt protein industry because it allows for um, like microorganisms such as fungi and bacteria to create proteins, um, and this can be harvested um, to uh, and become plant-based. Uh, no, sorry, become fermentation-derived proteins. And so there are three different types of fermentation. Um, there is traditional fermentation, there's biomass fermentation, and position fermentation. Um, so I have limited time to explain everything, but you can kind of read that it's a little bit um, of different ways of, of creating um, um, fermentation products. And so then this is the APEC fermentation landscape. So you can see that over the years, there have been more and more companies um, that have um, appeared in APEC that are working on fermentation. And if I zoom into um, Singapore, these are some of the companies in Singapore that are working on fermentation. And I think Michael Vation will be speaking later as well, so you will hear from them. Okay, so now next I'm going to talk about how Singapore supports alt protein startups. So Singapore aims to be a leader in agri-food tech innovation. Um, they have a 30 by 30 goal where it is basically the aim is to produce 30% of the, of the food uh, locally in Singapore by 2030. And so Singapore has this food story R&D program providing funding to enable R&D in three areas. So that is sustainable urban food production, future foods and food safety science and innovation. So the one that is concerned alternative proteins is future foods. Um, as you can see here, they have included the cultured meat, also known as cultivated meat, plant protein, which is plant-based meat. Microbial protein is the fermentation derived proteins. And Singapore is home to multiple alt protein startups and companies. Um, we have the GFI APAC company database, and this shows um, that there are 58 Singapore companies so far working in alt protein. And if you go to the B2B ecosystem database, this is the companies that support the alt protein ecosystem. So that includes co-manufacturers, 
pilot facilities, ingredient suppliers, equipment suppliers, research institutions, etc. And there's 120 Singapore uh, company records in our database. And Singapore also ranks top in novel foods regulation. Um, we have the Singapore Food Agency, which has come up with, it's kind of like the FDA, um, and it created a novel foods framework that regulates food and food ingredients that have not been used before. There has also been the Future Ready Food Safety Hub, FRESH, which is a joint initiative by the Singapore Food Agency, NTU and ASTAR that studies new protocols for food safety. And as you know, uh, Singapore is also the first country in the world to approve cultivated um, meat. Um, and they have also approved protein meat from air by solar foods and also precision fermentation um, products as well. And there's also this um, kind of Food Innovate, which is a whole of government platform. It is kind of like a collaboration by Enterprise Singapore, um, EDB, Economic Development Board, the Jurong Town Corporation, Singapore Food Agency, um, Agency for Science, Technology and Research, and um, IPI Singapore. So you can see that there are actually multiple um, agencies in Singapore uh, or like kind of um, agencies or, or institutes that are supporting the food tech and alternative protein uh, industry. And Singapore also has infrastructure facilities as a launch pad for startups. For R&D and pilot infrastructure, you have Food Plant and you have the Boulay Givaudan Protein Innovation Center. And you have, um, for plant-based co-manufacturers, you have SG Protein and Crema Sustainable Foods. Um, for fermentation and cultivated CDMOs, there is Scale Up Bio for precision fermentation. Esco Ester is for cultivated meat. And for system enablers, there is Nuvasa. Um, so this, of course, is not exhaustive. There are still many more other players, but I'm just highlighting a few examples for you. Um, so finally, to wrap up, I will talk about the resources that you can check out uh, to find out more information. So one, you can go to a GFI APEX website um, and just search Singapore Government Support for Startups. We have this web page that showcases all the support that the government provides for startups, be it in R&D or talent development or infrastructure or networking. Um, there's a lot of um, support that you can find over here. So go to this web page. Um, and you can also go to this other web page, which is the Singapore Startup Manual. It's also on our GFI APAC website. Um, it gives you steps to how to start an alt protein business. Also gives you knowledge about Singapore and what you need to know about the Singapore landscape. So this is also a very useful resource to check out. And finally, we have Food Innovate. Um, and so you can find this by going to Enterprise Singapore, um, searching for Food Innovate on the website. And then you'll also come to this web page and that's where you can find out more resources as well. Okay, so yeah, basically that is kind of an overview of um, the alt protein landscape in APAC and Singapore and how Singapore supports its alt protein startups um, and some resources to check out. Um, since this is a very short presentation, I can't go into very much detail, but you can find out more by going to GFI APAC dash apac.org um, to learn more about the alt protein ecosystem in Asia Pacific. So with that, I end my presentation and thank you very much for listening to me. Sure. Okay, thanks Valerie uh, for this really nice overview, a great presentation and, and also in a concise manner, we, we get an idea of what is happening in Singapore and what are the opportunities also for European companies, uh, perhaps. So thanks a lot. Uh, Maria, maybe you want to introduce uh, Daniel? Okay, maybe I think it's time to, yeah. to go for our second speaker. Now we have seen uh, the global overview from, from Singapore. I think it's time to move to Europe. We are going to, to have a deep understanding about the, I think the, the, the biggest project funded by the European projects on the, or the European Commission on, on proteins. Uh, we have the pleasure to have here with us uh, the, the project coordinator, Daniel De La Puente. Uh, whenever you, you want, you, it would be fine. The floor is yours, Daniel. Hi, Maria. Thanks. Well, thanks, everyone. Thanks for being here and for choosing to be you know, with us for the next two hours. Um, I'll show my screen. 
and um, so uh, it should be. Do you see the screen now? Yes, Daniel, it's working. Yeah. So as I said, uh, good morning. My name is Daniel De La Puente, and I'll give you a short, like, um, ten-minute. Um, high-level overview of the state of alternative proteins in, in, in Europe. Um, I work for Thetic Theta. We are basically a, um, an, a private non-profit R&D center that we provide um, technological services to food industries like those you see there. And um, we are coordinators of Like a Pro. Like a Pro, it's probably one of the, of the largest EU-funded project and probably the first, um, the first um, funded project by Horizon uh, Europe on alternative protein products with a total budget of 14 million and then more than 40 partners. And um, the mode of like approach is basically turning alternative proteins from niche to mainstream, thus making them available for everybody everywhere. And this is more or less the context that uh, we are using to, to, to get um, information for this presentation. Um, the Leica Pro is just, just following the current trend of investments into alternative proteins, as we can see on the left, from less than $500 million in back in 2015. Seven years later, we find ourselves with, uh, with uh, more than $5 billion um, dollars in this market. So interestingly, also, Europe is the second largest geographical area in terms of private investment. So this gives us a, a voice in the new market and explains why the, the European Commission has put you know, so much effort in on, 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 on this project. Um, so let me go over the definition of alternative proteins by the European Commission, because if we put together different topics of the work packages of the, of the Operation Europe, um, we can say that the, the European Commission, uh, the European Commission understands as alternative proteins, plant-based, micro-based, ocean-based, fungus, insect, and culture meat. We will go over it one by one, uh, but uh, in general, they 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 have three claims basically in common. But they are healthy in terms of a good source of bioavailable protein with a good nutritional profile. They are also claimed to be sustainable, uh, which is one of the reasons why they exist. Basically, they save energy, they are more circular, they emit less CO2, and most of them also have an ethical claim, like they are vegan or bio, which would be the equivalent to organic in the US, or fair. Um, so now let's see them one by one. Plant-based is, the, of course, the, the best known, being pulses like beans, lentils, and seeds the most used because of their protein content. Um, so as Valerie explained already, um, well, they can be just vegetables or ingredients as part of, 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 of products like the one she, she, she showed. Um, for instance, in like a pro, we are, the German Frank Hofer is working on the use of protein contained in kernel of rape seed. So after the extraction of the um, rape seed oil, we, we have a cake, so the idea is using those proteins for human um, food. So it's a circular approach on top of, of, of the current trends. Then micro-based proteins, I'm taking the same breakdown as Valerie. And um, so following the same breakdown, as I said, uh, we have traditional fermentation. I would like to highlight like Kinoko, which is the, an Israeli company that grows a special, a special mycelium on beans and grains into a whole food with, with new textures. Uh, so they do the what's so-called solid state fermentation. Uh, for biomass fermentation or single cell proteins, we count with um, Calidris Bio, uh, a Belgian company um, that produces a microbial biomass via fermentation of renewable methanol. And the thing is that the biomass itself, without any further treatment, has already a 65, 70% protein content with high amount of essential amino acids. So it's a, it's a good source of protein too. Um, then ocean-based, the easiest said or considered theoretically fish, algae, and invertebrates. Fish, in my opinion, is not really an alternative protein. But if we consider the fact that only like 60% of the, of, of the fish itself is processed as human food, then the rest is either feed or waste. 
So then efforts could be put on upcycling that remaining 40% into human food products. And this is what the Norwegian uh, seafood Norway is doing with the heads like fillet trims and cutoffs and swim bladder and backbones, turning them into high quality uh, products. So it's not, as I said, a, a, a true alternative protein, but we can consider it um, in, in, in for some perspectives. Then algae, also very widely known on the supermarket shelf already, ranging from seaweed, to powders and in between, you know, products containing um, algae. Invertebrates, they're partially already well known, like, like for instance, Japan or Spain are the second large and, and first and, and, and second larger, uh, largest fish markets in the world, respectively. So that's seafood, basically. However, we can exploit some other species like krill, which is uh, being done by Rainfrost in, in Leica Pro to produce krill and oil powder that are rich, is very rich in protein. And there we are also ex exploring some other less like um, um, appealing species like the sea cucumber. Um, although if, if I, as far as I know in the Asian market, they are not, um, they are not um, unusual. Then of course we have microprotein, which is also very trendy. I think the reason it's uh, it's vegan and it has low fat, sugar, high protein, but in terms of food technology, it's neutral in color, taste, and smell. So we it's very versatile. You can you know produce any product from that ingredient uh, without having to mask uh, odors or colors. So um, so it's very versatile. Has a lot of potential. Of course, in this category, we also have you know mushrooms as as, as you know the the ones that we eat every day. Insects uh, is also a big player. We count on, um, we have insect in Leica Pro with Y, which is one of the companies with the with largest companies in, in Europe. They have EFSA approved products for human consumption. I will go over the EFSA approval later on. And um, also insect breeding not only provides food ingredients, but also feed and for cattle and fertilizer for plants. So the main claim of these proteins is also sustainability and circularity. Of course, it's not vegan. And then we have cultured meat, which is basically animal cell grown, animal cells grown in a lab. It has apparently four key areas of improvement, which is cell lines, medias, by reactors, and scaffolding. Basically, the entire technology, right? But uh, um, well, globally, um, duck cells are being grown as foie gras, like uh, also beef or steaks and burgers, chicken nuggets, pork, sausages, and seafood. And I, I said like the technology. Um, has these four areas for improvement, which is more or less why the the and, and we let it, this is related to the I think the the um, how the EC is approaching culture meat. So the EC has funded three projects with you know European uh, R and D funds that we can see on the left. The first is on plant based growth factors uh, because these normally come from animal fetuses. So um, we have also the Spanish biotech foods with uh, two point seven million funding and plus a, a national Spanish grant. And then we have Metable, which are Dutch, also receiving three million euro. However, the, I think the EC is still a little skeptical, in my opinion, because now under the R&D funding program Horizon Europe, there is only one topic about cultured meat and cultured seafood, as you see there, and it explicitly excludes any development of, of technology or products on this field and exclusively focuses on knowing better what the claims of cultivated meat are, basically environmental benefits, economic and social aspects. So it's a theoretical topic. So it's giving 7 million just to know whether the claims uh, hold true or basically what are the numbers behind, probably as a first step to then, you know, injecting more money for, for the, the, the development of the technology itself. Then um, one point worth mentioning in Europe is the fact that many alternative proteins are considered noble foods. Uh, the noble food in Europe is Foods not consumed before, uh, well, significantly before May 1997, and in this category fall many protein, many alternative proteins, like insect, microbial protein, or microprotein. And to obtain an authorization for human consumption in Europe, the food companies need to produce a dossier that um, <clears throat> that is going to be evaluated by EFSA, which will be the equivalent to the to the um, FDA, for instance, and. Um, so this EFTA assesses the risks on the safety of the novel food. If it's positive, then it goes forward and it can be finally authorized. So in the case of, of, of insects, 
um, these four species there are, are authorized for human consumption, like the mealworm, the, the loc locust, house cricket, and then another kind of mealworm. And that's it. There are many dossiers being evaluated, some of them positive, some they're not. And But in summary, Europe regulation for novel food can play a key role for commercialization. That needs to be bear in mind. And then also the, the texture of it. Um, probably most, like almost none of us were born vegan. Uh, so most of us basically were raised in a culture of eating meat or fish or seafood. And we are used to that texture, right? To how it feels when 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 we when we bite it or when you would when we chew it. Also, our recipes are based on these products. So in the short term, alternative proteins tend to become like meat or fish analogs, like vegetable burgers or salmon by Rivo Foods, which is the an Austrian company in Liker Pro. So um also new ways of consuming proteins like convenient foods lead a tendency towards new product in which texture is key. So texture could be a, a game changer in alternative proteins. And then this is the most social science part of alternative proteins. We, and it's the final part of my presentation. So not only food aspects are important, but also, as I said, social sciences. So our research in like a pro suggests that Europeans are omnivorous. We eat basically regularly animal-based proteins. It's worth mentioning that there are some so-called pescatarians. They only eat uh, fish, no meat. And um, there's also like more or less 40% of the, of the population that considers themselves either flexitarian, which is basically someone that eats uh, meat and, and fish, but only occasionally. Also, vegetarian people that, uh, but still, you know, consume animal products like eggs, for instance, or vegans that no animal product whatsoever. So, uh, and this is the context in which alternative proteins are being developed. This is the market. So, um, and, and now you understand why the role of Tetra is so important, because we need to replace what we are eating already by, by other alternative proteins, but maintaining that texture, that flavor. So um, also some profiles are more prone to eat our alternative proteins. We've, we've seen that like women with, uh, from the generation set with higher education who live in cities tend to eat more alternative proteins, you know, versus baby boomers, um, baby boomer men with basic education who live in the countryside. But there are also other factors like religion where it's where, you know, Consumers are part of vulnerable groups, so that needs to bear in mind to 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 be bearing in mind to when when we're approaching uh, consumers. And then finally, this is my last slide. I would like to conclude mentioning that the food environment, which is a, a key part of Lyca Pro, is really matters. Food environment is defined as the physical, economic, political, and sociocultural context. Is the context in which we make decisions for acquiring, preparing, and consuming food. Right. So let's go one by one. Uh, over these factors. For instance, alternative proteins are more special, uh, sorry, expensive than conventional proteins. So um, we they will reach less, less, less consumers. Also, they are sometimes suboptimally placed on supermarket shelves. For instance, like if they are put together with other dietary or gluten-free product on dedicated aisles, that may deter some people with shy profiles from buying it, you know. Um, so also some supermarkets just may not want to risk the profitability of a spot on the shelf by replacing like a short shot like pork chorizo by a vegan alternative, because in the end, their business is making money. So they are risking it. So although the products may be there, we cannot have access to them as consumers for, for these reasons. Also labeling is somehow confusing, you know, especially for analogs like, hey, they are is this pork or not? So uh, also allergenicity of the ingredients, especially for me, uh, fish analogs. Uh, so also some consumers are tired of soy as the main ingredient, being soy somehow controversial for how it is grown in some parts of the world at the expense of rainforest. We all know that. And then also menus in general normally center around meat and fish in the food service. So even you, even when you want to consume them, you don't find them on the menu, right? So this is just my, my last um, comment. So the, the summary is that there's more to alternative proteins than just the product or the technology itself and the food environment really matters. And that would be all. So uh, thank you very much. Do you guys hear me? 
Yeah, thank you so much, Daniel. Thank yeah. you for the interesting thank presentation you. of the Leica Pro project, and specifically, thank you for for the findings uh, from the social science perspective because I found really really interesting. Uh, now, Emma, I think it's time to yes. go through masterclass one. Do you yes. To... So, so great. Yes, we start with the company presentations now. Uh, so, thanks again to the keynote speakers. Wonderful presentations indeed. And, and now we have uh, three company presentations uh, lined up. So, three companies uh, working in the field of uh, fermentation derived uh, proteins. And we kick off with uh, with Avecom. Uh, one of the key players, I think, in the field of alternative proteins uh, in Europe, a Belgian company. Stan, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Emma. Good morning and good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, I'll first share my presentation. Uh, yes, I think you can see it now. So my name is um, Stan Boeren, CEO and owner of uh, Avicom. We are uh, founded 28 years ago as one of the first spin-out companies from uh, Ghent uh, University. And we have an expertise uh, in optimizing and steering microbial processes. So why uh, did we start uh, 20 years, uh, 28 years ago? Eh? Because we see some environmental super challenges. Uh, think about climate change and global warming. And we believe that we um, have the right expertise in research, uh, development, and innovation capacities to turn those complex uh, problems into opportunities and into, into a commercially viable solutions. So we really want to be a catalyst for, for the new bioeconomy by developing bio-based, biodegradable solutions and more circular uh, processes. Uh, and for that, we collaborate always across the whole value chain. And so we are not a standalone company. We, we work together with, with feedstock producers. We work together with end users, industrial companies that can scale up and commercialize our solutions. So we are really one, one piece of the puzzle by bringing in our specific expertise. So our mission is to develop those uh, solutions, innovative and sustainable solutions for environmental and industrial problems, because we want to push forward the application towards commercialization and that those microbial products and processes are really uh, part of, of the future uh, products and, and that, we, that we buy. So we have structured our company now in two uh, separate business units, eh? but they are uh, working together to close the loop. So first of all, the environmental department looks into water, soil and groundwater remediation. That is really the breakdown of pollutants into, into specific uh, yeah, non-harmless, uh, non, non harmful uh, compounds. But on the other hand, and that is then the focus of the presentation today, we have our fermentation or biosynthesis department where we can start from industrial gases, from waste streams, or from residual side streams from agriculture or the food industry, and upgrade those streams by means of microbial fermentation into products such as uh, microbial proteins. We are based uh, still in Ghent, eh, which is uh, after all, uh, I think, uh, yeah, one of the headquarters of biotech in the world. Uh, so very happy that we can work from here. We have our own labs, we have our own, pi own pilot scale facilities and are even capable to produce small batches of products for commercial applications. So I think we are quite flexible um, if to, in that, to that extent that we really have on in-house in quite a lot of expertise, of course, from our people on the one hand, but also have the right infrastructure to, yeah, to really focus and to accelerate uh, the development of our different products and processes. And focusing on microbial fermentation, eh, Avicom focuses uh, mostly on microbial biomass fermentation. Also, the previous speakers mentioned uh, microbial biomass fermentation as one of the routes to produce uh, alternative proteins. Um, what I think makes Avicom a very interesting partner to collaborate with is that we have a, a biomass fermentation platform developed that is very flexible because we can work on the one hand with with quite a lot of different feedstocks. Eh? We work with industrial gases. I will show you uh, an example. We can work with uh, side streams from the food industry. We have a, a very uh, interesting case study from the potato processing industry. We can even work with, with waste streams to convert those uh, feedstocks 
into proteins, and those proteins then can have uh, quite a lot of, 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 of different applications. So, of course, feed and food is, of course, a, a logical uh, approach uh, to, to use and to consume our proteins, but we also look into the production of biopolymers uh, of, or, 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 yeah, of, of the, the precursors to produce food packaging solutions. We also look into uh, circular biofertilizers, so we are quite large in terms of feedstock choice and, and, and application of, of the, the biomasses itself. So um, a couple of case studies, uh, and I do only have 10 minutes, but just to show you a bit what, what we have achieved uh, until now. Uh, with Promic, we upgrade this industrial side streams and co-products from the food industry uh, to produce a single cell protein that is feed grade. Uh, so we, we produce with microbial biomass fermentation a non-GMO protein source, high in protein content, 70% uh, protein content, with a very favorable amino acid composition. It's better than soy. It approaches uh, fish meal quality. And we see, of course, next to the nutritional values that we have an excellent digestibility, feed uptake, and conversion, and an added value in terms of an increased immunostimulating potential. Uh, when we uh, do feed trials on, on different types of shrimps, fish, piglets, uh, and things like that, uh, yeah, we always see that besides the nutritional aspects, also a health factor comes into play when you replace part, uh, partly the, the, the proteins by, by a microbial protein source uh, like our Promic. A second um, application is our power to protein process, where we really want to go to, to, uh, to a food grade uh, for uh, protein for human consumption. Um, and we also want to uh, create the uh, platform that is the most sustainable that you can imagine. So it's microbial gas fermentation platform. We combine here uh, CO2, hydrogen gas, and oxygen gas. So it's a CO2 consuming process. We do not emit anymore any CO2 overall. No, we con consume the CO2 to produce the proteins. For that, I need an energy source, which is hydrogen gas, but both the hydrogen gas and the oxygen gas can be produced if I have the availability of clean water and clean energy. So it's a carbon capturing process to produce the proteins we all need. It remains a biomass that is full of proteins, 70% or more proteins. We even produce some vitamins like vitamin B12. Uh, and this is a very promising technology for the future if we can have an acceptable cost of hydrogen gas. And we, we all know we need to ca capture our, our carbon and we still need to eat. So I think this brings together a bit the, the different environmental challenges with how we can produce food in the future. Then very shortly, uh, some other applications of, of, of our bi uh, microbial biomasses, we also see that they can become a source of biopolymers. I have uh, here shown uh, on one slide uh, two specific European projects where we worked uh, towards uh, that. Uh, so we can convert, for instance, in the first project, uh, a residual side stream such as, as cheese whey into a biomass that contains quite a lot of PHBV that can then be further used to produce uh, food packaging. So also there it remains biomass fermentation, but with a different application. And then the second one, the Ecoplastic project is a uh, European funded project that is quite interesting, uh, as I might say, because we there convert plastic waste, mixed plastic waste. Eh? We, we use different steps to treat that plastic waste. But after all, we, we will create a, a backbone that can then be microbially fermented and to produce there again biopolymers that can then be used in, in the bioplastics production. So that is really even beyond feed and food applications, it's beyond using, uh, for instance, uh, a, a starch or sugar as, an, as a feedstock. No, we start from real plastic waste break that down and upgrade that again into a biopolymer for bioplastics production. And last but not least, something that is uh, very challenging at the moment in Europe is, is, is then uh, plant nutrition. Sustainable plant nutrition is, 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 is a hot topic uh, today. Um, microbial biomass has been tested and is now tested also in two uh, supplementary uh, European projects to use it as an uh, as a slow release organic fertilizer. Eh? Finally, protein is a backbone with nitrogen and phosphorus on it. It has some uh, very good uh, properties to use it as a, as in fertilizing applications. 
uh, and with, with, yeah, with, with the energy crisis that we see and with the rise of nitrogen cost, this might become uh, sooner or later a, a very cost competitive alternative. And so besides the sustainability aspect, also the cost is of course always of importance, but we are working towards those applications too. So to summarize, uh, what do you need to remind from Avicom after this short presentation? We started up as one of the first spin-outs uh, of Ghent University in 1995. Our founder is Professor Willy Verstraten. You have to look him up. He's a highly cited researcher. He's very known in his, in his field and even in 2022 still rewarded as one of scientists uh, worldwide. Our core expertise as Avicom is microbial resource management. Uh, we steer optimized microbial processes towards different applications that can be feed and food, but we go beyond that. But microbial biomass fermentation is the platform that we use to achieve that. So we are an innovative research and development driven SME. Uh, we have a proven track record. Eh? We are not burning cash. We are successfully developing in collaboration with academics and industry, the products and the, the solutions of the future. We have, uh, of course, protected uh, our know-how. So we have at the moment nine patents and uh, we work quite a lot in, in collaborations as mentioned. So up till now we have uh, had 15 EU funded projects to give you an idea. So thanks a lot for your attention. If you have more questions, of course, feel free to contact me. You can also find on the last slide uh, a, a code. If you scan that, you will find uh, a, 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 our uh, webinar we gave last year, which is a one hour uh, presentation about microbial fer uh, uh, fermentation and all the types of applications. So yeah, I only had 10 minutes today, but if you need more information, please check out that webinar or contact me and we discuss this in, uh, in detail. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stan. Very nice presentation and good idea to include the QR code. Uh, in the meantime, there are two questions for you. Um, so there's one in the chat and one in the Q&A. Uh, so we will take the questions uh, at the end of the webinar. But if you, in the meantime, would already like to answer in the chat and Q&A, please uh, go ahead. Um, and then I will now announce the next speaker, which is uh, Dr. Yasha Sweeney. Uh, from um, my covation, so working on, on the first microprotein technology company in Asia. So we're really happy to have you here, uh, doctor, and I just give you the virtual floor. Uh, go ahead, please. Thanks, Emma. Thanks uh, for this opportunity. And I'm very excited to be presenting what work microvation has been doing uh, to this audience. So I'll go ahead with uh, sharing my screen. Great. Uh, uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I'm Dr. Yasha Swini. Uh, in short, uh, Dr. Yasha, I'm the co-CEO and Chief Product Officer of Microvation, where uh, uh, it's an immense pleasure to be presenting mycelium as a super ingredient uh, in this uh, presentation where we are talking about uh, how the future of protein is evolving. And I'd like to present the versatility of mycelium as one of the ingredients. And uh, at Microvation, uh, we are forging the future of food and by transforming mycelium into novel food ingredients using fermentation technology. So our products fall into the category of fermentation-derived ingredients. We are a Singaporean headquartered company uh, with a uh, significant presence in India and in South Korea as well. And uh, we have been supported by a good food institute in India. We were one of the winners of the Smart Protein Innovation Challenge 2022. At the same time, uh, we were re recently graduated from a K startup grad challenge in South Korea and have access to the South Korean market as well. And uh, we are a B2B company, uh, which is developing the, these novel ingredients, which can be used in various food and beverage applications uh, by food manufacturers. And uh, in the recent year, everybody has been talking about a shift in the preferences of uh, the food we consume and why that needs to shift from the conventional uh, to the product. Uh, the main criteria for the shift is three major challenges, that is sustainability, environmental concerns, and ethics. So generally, these are the major pain points that is uh, uh, the need for the alternative proteins. 
And uh, just like how the earlier speaker uh, presented, uh, the alternative proteins are categorized into three broad uh, ca categories like plant-based, cultivated, and fermentation-derived. However, there are additional protein sources that can uh, be depended on, like insect or ocean-derived products as well. Uh, however, uh, we fall under the category of fermentation derived ingredients where we use microbial proteins as a source of uh, nutrition. And uh, however, uh, with the emergence of alternative proteins, there are significant challenges also being addressed by these food manufacturers. That is, uh, the alternative proteins still have a drawback in mimicking the taste and texture of conventional meat products. At the same time, the nutritional composition, which may not be similar to the conventional products, at the same the long term impact and about the affordability and price parity, which is a major challenge for the alternative protein manufacturers to challenge the conventional meat or dairy or any other product that is conventional. And food manufacturers uh, are always in the lookout of new ingredients that are natural minimally processed and at the same time have versatility that can uh, be used in various applications. And we believe that fermentation derived ingredients have better applications, not just in plant-based and cultivated meat application, but also as a functional food ingredients. So our ingredients could be used as a uh, fat substitutes, as protein alternatives, flavoring agents, at the same time binding agents, and can also be used as uh, growth factors and scaffolds in cultivated meat applications. And with this idea, we uh, worked a lot about uh, understanding how my mycelium can be used as a novel ingredient. Uh, we all have been uh, using my, my, my uh, mushrooms uh, for over centuries uh, for its medicinal and health benefits. And mycelium is a integral part of the life cycle of mushrooms. And Best life cycle period of a mushroom, uh, to be more precise. And mycelium is also known to be secreting or producing uh, much more proteins and diverse and unique proteins in comparison to what mushrooms do produce. And there is a difference between single cell flagellated fungi as well as mycelium of uh, mushroom producing fungi. And mushrooms are also known for their army flavor already. We zeroed down on utilizing mycelium from mushrooms, uh, and it also has a benefit of getting uh, regulatory approved easily because these are uh, gourmet edible strains of mushrooms that's already in the market. And our ingredients are known to enhance the taste and texture of both plant-based and cellular meat products. They are highly customizable, high customizable in the sense we can work with a wide range of strains and substrates be it uh, the agri substrates or uh, industrial side streams as well. At the same time, they are also nutritive, uh, high in nutrition because mushrooms or mycelium are known to produce unique uh, secondary metabolites and enzymes that is not found in either animal or plant kingdom. And uh, with that, we have uh, two range of our ingredient products. They are called as mix and mimic. Mix is a highly customizable fermented flour produced using solid state fermentation. Uh, and the base is plant-based materials. Uh, and it acts as a natural uh, taste enhancer or a flavor masking agent. At the same time, uh, a protein supplement. And our second range is uh, Mimic. Min Mimic is a pure mycelial biomass, which can be used as a whole cart replacement. At the same time, they can also be used to extract or isolate microproteins. And how do we make them? It's uh, using a very simple uh, traditional uh, fermentation technology. We identify the right strain and substrate and ferment them. And we have two platforms, uh, the solid state and liquid fermentation platform, which uh, the output of which is mix and mimic. And this gave us an idea uh, of developing a microsmart platform because we have a wide range of uh, strains. We have over 25 uh, strains in our repository and at the same time, we can work with a wide range of substrate materials, starting from agricultural side streams, industrial side streams, and upscale them to valuable ingredients. And our micro smart platform is a unique combination of strains, substrates, fermentation technology, and optimized protocols that helps us identify or provide solution to our clients 
uh, for a no novel ingredient. And just like how I mentioned, our ingredients can be used in various plant-based protein applications as base ingredient, masking agent, and flavor enhancer. And as functional food products uh, in energy bars and uh, cereals, as protein boost of uh, fortified ingredients and as sub stabilizer, and in a cultivated space as scaffolds and growth factors. Uh, our ingredient could also be used as a hybrid uh, product uh, where we can use our ingredient alongside the cultivated uh, meat products. And there are various opportunities in the stream. Uh, just like how uh, we uh, ended up being Asia's first mycelium derived ingredient company, the space is ever evolving and has wide opportunities. Uh, there are over 1,800 edible strains of mushrooms itself. Uh, set aside newer strains that's been identified. And there is a wide opportunity to research on strain development, process optimization, and scaling up challenges. And uh, we are always open for collaboration and co-creation as we are one of the B2B companies developing these ingredients. And the end applications can be developed by uh, the food manufacturers. And uh, we are a small team. Uh, I had the R&D uh, and we have Dr. Yongsim Tang, who is our chief technology officer. And uh, he is a graduate from NTU and is expert uh, in fermentation technology. Uh, we have Munju, who is looking at uh, the business development. We are also supported by Riraji, a venture studio partner. Mr. Shivasa Sarla and uh, Gaurav are uh, an integral part of our team uh, looking after the administration strategies and business marketing. And that's it. Uh, you can reach out to me at the above uh, email ID and uh, the website. I'm open for questions. Thank you, Dr. Yashaswini. Great presentation as well. Uh, we are receiving comments indeed in the chat that the presentations are all great. So also the audience uh, is enjoying them. If you have questions, please uh, put them in the chat, any questions you have. And we will kind of um, at the end of the webinar uh, go through the questions one by one. Um, so the next uh, company presenting uh, during this first masterclass is Paleo. Uh, Paleo is uh, another Belgian company and they are producing a GMO-free bioidentical heme protein. Uh, many different heme proteins, I should say. So Hermes, please, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, great that you're here. Thank you. Yeah, and you will be in control of the presentation. Yes, so <laughs> make Maria, a sign so just, uh, you can give her yeah. instructions. So yeah. my name is uh, Hermes, Hermes Sanctorum, uh, CEO of Palio, so Belgium-based uh, precision fermentation uh, company. Uh, I myself, uh, I'm a bioengineer uh, by, by training. Afterwards, I went into politics. So I also have a bit of a political background, was a member of parliament for 10 years. But then I decided to try to change the world uh, on the other side, uh, more in uh, entrepreneurship and uh, on the industrial side. Uh, next slide, please. So what do we do? What does Palio do? Well, in one sentence, it would be this. Palio uses precision fermentation to produce functional ingredients for meat and fish alternatives to create an ultimate meat and fish experience. So what does that mean? Well, let's start with the, the last block to create an ultimate meat and fish experience. Our uh, driver um, of Palio is uh, to decrease meat consumption, to decrease meat production. And we strongly uh, agree with uh, the analysis that in order to decrease meat consumption, you need to offer a very credible alike alternative. Uh, that is not just our analysis, of course, this is um, stated by multiple studies and is also confirmed by, by yeah, the many conversations that, that we have with uh, uh, people in the, in, in the food industry. So you need to make a good alternative. For that, you need a hyper-functional ingredient uh, to, to increase the, the, the quality, let's say, of the meat and fish alternatives, or more or less the imitation uh, of, uh, of meat. Um, I mean, if, if we talk to, to uh, plant-based food manufacturers, uh, we see a lot of pride of their products, but everyone realizes we are not there yet. I mean, there is a lot of diversity, a lot has happened the past 20 years, but to go to the next stage of uh, plant-based food uh, consumption as an alternative for meat, we really need to, to increase the quality. And for that, we use precision fermentation. The next slide, please. 
Yeah, um, so precision fermentation, what is it exactly? Well, I guess we all know uh, fermentation. I'm not sure how uh, scientific uh, the audience is, but of course, uh, fermentation, everyone knows it as a technology behind uh, brewing beer, baking bread. Uh, so it's in fact a very positive thing. Uh, precision fermentation basically is, is using that kind of technology. However, you use it to produce a particular compound. And what do we do? Like other precision fermentation companies, you insert a, a DNA, a piece of DNA coding for, for a certain protein, in our case, an animal protein. You insert it in the yeast, and the yeast starts producing that protein. So basically, you have animal proteins, but without the animals. So it's a fantastic uh, uh, technology. So what do we make? We make heme proteins, myoglobins. And the myoglobins are, uh, and next slide, please. Myoglobins are uh, compounds that are present in conventional meat. So when you look to, for instance, a steak, it's red. Well, the red color, it's uh, due to the myoglobin which is present in a very low concentration, but it has a high impact, but also the aromatic profile. So when you grill meat and, and you, you really have that, that uh, those specific compounds, those volatile compounds that you smell, of course, the metallic taste that all comes uh, or is, is related to the presence of uh, myoglobin. And last but not least, it's also about iron. Uh, myoglobin contains iron. And if there is one reason to eat meat, um, well, even as a vegetarian or vegan myself, I have to admit iron is challenging for most vegans and vegetarians. So um, myoglobin contains heme iron, which is very uh, accessible for the human body. So it's the bioavailable uh, uh, form of, uh, of iron. So what, in the end, what do we produce? We have an animal-free animal protein, which of course is based on our ethical values. That's the reason that we do it. But it's also GMO free. And that's, that was a bit of a tricky one. Uh, of course, you can imagine uh, if you insert DNA in yeast, that is a genetically modified organism. However, our te technology makes sure that the yeast secretes the protein. And in the end, we separate the protein from the yeast. So we have a pure protein. And that is considered GMO free. That is uh, especially important in uh, the European Union because uh, a an, an, an GMO food product basically is a showstopper uh, for the regulatory uh, um, bodies. It's, 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 you have to follow a hard GMO track, uh, but also the industry is, 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 uh, not, is reluctant to use a GMO product because consumers are, are very critical towards it. In Asia, it might be a bit different, however, uh, you, we also see, as you know, uh, that um, uh, consumers are increasingly critical in, in Asia. So we really believe that also in, in, the, in APEC region, uh, GMO-free product has, has a, a, a high potential. Next uh, slide, please. Yeah, we're talking about ethics. So animal welfare, obviously, because you, you don't use any animals. But there is more than that. It's, of course, also about sustainability. So according to our own uh, LCA tool, so life cycle assessment, we're talking about, I mean, 80% less uh, greenhouse gas emissions and 90% less water use and a one fold reduction. So minus 99% of land use. And I think that's the biggest uh, advantage of, of most uh, um, technologies to offer uh, an alternative for meat and especially precision fermentation is that you will need far less farmland. So that's vast areas that can be uh, used again to, to, to reforestate, uh, so to, to, uh, to repair uh, ecosystems. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, here I, I show uh, something that, that Palio in fact found out. So you have, of course, myoglobin, which is an, a present in meat, but uh, for every species, you have a different myoglobin. And we discovered that these myoglobins, they differ quite a bit. So to, to give an example, uh, the, the, so the left slide, you, you see a graph of pyrazines. So those are volatile compounds related to uh, grilled meat. And uh, 
If you compare a mammoth myoglobin, which we also made, and a bovine uh, um, myoglobin, then you see that the, the level of certain pyrazines are, are uh, higher compared to, to, to the other. So there are different properties, which of course offers uh, an opportunity to, to diversity of uh, products. Uh, next slide, and I believe that's the last slide. Yeah, about the potential. This is uh, the most cited graph, I believe, uh, about uh, protein uh, transition or transformation. So coming from uh, BCG and Blue Horizon. They is dated, may, maybe a bit dated, 2021. However, it's confirmed again by their new report uh, a few months ago. So basically, the expectation is that um, the, uh, the use of alternative proteins will uh, grow exponentially. It will double after a while and it will double uh, again. Of course, to really make sure that happens, we need these highly functional ingredients like Microvation was also showing, by the way. I mean, we will need a lot of different uh, innovative tools to make sure that the plant-based foods become much better uh, than today. And uh, that, that's, of course, topic, uh, the focus on APAC. We, of course, are also very interested in, in the Asian Pacific region. We get uh, contacted a lot by companies uh, over there. Uh, I mean, there are multiple reasons uh, to go there, especially um, the, yeah, the, the growing demands, the growing population over there, uh, higher income, I mean, the, the, the more critical attitudes that, 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 is, that is growing. It's all uh, an opportunity for companies like us. On the other hand, there are also challenges, of course. I mean, APEC, it's like talking about Earth. I mean, it's so diverse. There are a lot of cultural differences. So uh, currently we are, we are making the assessment how we will deal with that, where could we start? We didn't make a decision yet, uh, but for sure uh, APEC uh, should be an, a, a fantastic uh, region to, to develop our uh, activities. I thank you. Thank you very much, Hermes, uh, and thanks also for pointing out the opportunities and challenges you see uh, in uh, cooperating with APEC, so because this is indeed the objective uh, of our project. Uh, if you have any questions uh, for Hermes, please put them in the chat. I think you can stay, stay on a couple of some time, right, Hermes? Yeah, yeah sure, uh, sure. We have a very busy there. day, but you can still take questions in the end, so that's great. Sure. So uh, I conclude the first masterclass, and Maria, I guess you will introduce the second one now. Yes, first of all, thank you uh, to the audience to, to remain here, and thank you, our expert panel to, uh, of Masterclass 1. Now let's go to Masterclass 2. Now we are going to make a tour through cultural meat, and specifically we, are, we, we have here uh, three uh, frontrunners from, from Korea. And I have the pleasure to have here with, with me in, in screen, Senjong Park uh, from Food Police, which is the person from Korea who helped us uh, building this, this competitive uh, program. So I think he, uh, she's going to be the, the perfect person to make the introductions of all the companies. Uh, Senjong, are you there? Yes, I am here. Okay, we cannot see you. Yeah, the video okay. is stopped, so. Can anyone turn on my video, please? Yes. <laughs> okay, now it's working. Okay. Yeah, good evening and good morning, everyone. I am Sun Young Park, PR Assistant Manager of Food Police. So Food Police has joined as a global future partner last November. So it is Korea's first time to join in this program. So as the food technology industry is gaining a lot more interest in Korea, and a lot of guests has joined today's seminar, including 22 Korean companies, and also the Korean Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Food Police provides various support systems for, for Korean food companies and members worldwide. We are fostering them into a global scale and more information will be presented on the Korean training session in the future. So stay tuned with that. I hope the seminar and the whole project could be a great opportunity for everyone to understand the Korean food market and also make great collaboration with the Korean companies. Our three players who will run session two are Tissen Biofarm, Simple Planet, and Seawit. The screen will be shortly handed over to our first speaker, CSO of Tissen Biofarm, Ms. Lyonju, for the presentation. Ms. La, the floor is all yours. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, can someone allow me to share my screen? Okay, uh, can everyone see the screen? Yes, fine now. Okay, uh, yeah, I will start. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Yeonju La, Chief Strategy Officer of TSM Biofarm. It's great to be here to present our team and what we are working on. We are a team developing mass production technology of whole cut culture meat that has rear texture and modeling. We are a food technology company making the highest quality sustainable culture. Sorry. <laughs> um, highest quality sustainable culture meat. Founded in 2021, we will soon have 15 members next month. Our latest funding was from the summer of last year, in which four investors participated Mira Holdings, Envisioning Partners, Future Play, and Stonebridge Ventures. We've won six awards from various startup contests and actively building our patent portfolio. Our mission is to make the highest quality sustainable future food with innovative technologies. Our vision is to make a future where people, the environment and animals are safe. Sorry. Um, we are a team of top experts in various fields promoting multidisciplinary research, with it, which is essential for cultured meat. Uh, CEO Won Il Han received a PhD in tissue engineering from Postdoc Korea Top Tier Tech University. Uh, he's been working on developing human artificial organs using 3D bioprinting for seven years, producing 11 publications and eight patents. As the lead of business strategy, uh, I have a degree from Oxford University and six years of experience in the field of alternative protein and sustainability. Director Kwon is a full stack IT engineer leading our data and IT infrastructure. The research advisor, Professor Cho, is a globally renowned academic in the field of tissue engineering. He's also a co-founder of TNR Biofab, which is listed on the Kodak market. Our team members have various academic backgrounds such as cell biology, 3D bioprinting, biomaterials, genetic engineering, biochemistry, chemical engineering, clinical pathology, mechanical engineering, and electronic engineering. This is what we have achieved in less than two years. Our co-founders got together in May 2021 and incorporated the company in November 2021. In the same months, we won four prizes at various startup competition and received seed funding in the following months. In May 2022, we were selected for the Tech Incubator Program for Startup for Startup Korea, which is the most prestigious startup program funded by the Korean government. In August 2022, we raised pre-series A funding from four investors. Our track record shows our team's speed and competency. Our main product is a whole steak with rear texture and modeling. This is our latest prototype with natural modeling. We can adjust the contents and pattern of fat, as you can see in the picture. The second type is lean meat without any fat. The third type is pattern meat, which can be customized uh, as per individual preferences. We start with beef and will expand to pork and other species. As you may know, the three main components of culture meat technologies are cell scaffold and cell culture media. However, as we have to produce mass produce meat, um, we introduce the concept of biofabrication. Biofabrication is the process of generating biologically functional product with cells, bioactive molecules, and biomaterials, and etc. In the context of culture meat, it is a methodology to produce physically structured meat with the ingredients, cells, scaffold, and culture media. As a result, we have six areas of technical focus, biomimicry, cell, 
set them signal and database. This approach is based on our technical background. Our technology is built upon Postdex World Class Lab developing human artificial organs for medical use. It's been ranked as global third best lab in bioprinting and tissue engineering by Saival Elsevier. The lab is known for its competency to develop 3D bio cell printing systems and functional bio ink from various organs and tissues from head to toe. With this technical background, our team has developed novel technologies optimized for cell culture meat. First, we can reproduce meat structures from microns to meters, which become real textures and modeling. Second, we make edible bio ink, which is highly nutritious and functional for cell growth. Third, our novel manufacturing system can produce all types and parts of meat very fast. For example, we can fabricate fat and flesh at the same time at an ultra fast speed. These are some of our earlier prototypes with texture, modeling, fat, and fascia. The one on the right hand side is 30 centimeters long and five centimeters thick. Our solubilization technology can be used to make bio ink from various food materials, such as uh, vegetables, mushrooms, grains, and legumes. Our research show that all cells are alive and well attached together in the bio ink. Our novel manufacturing system allows the ultra fast fabrication of meat. Compared to conventional bioprinting, it is up to 8,500 faster. This enables us to produce 900 kilograms per day at full capacity. Compared to what Future Meat Technologies has uh, mentioned in the media, our production volume is twice bigger. Our innovative technologies have overcome the technical challenges of the current industries, such as mass production and production cost. We can mass produce whole steak with rear texture and modeling very fast at lower cost. It makes us uniquely positioned to win the global culture meat market. We are the only culture meat company that can mass produce whole steak with real texture and modeling. We are building our IP portfolio very strongly. Three patents are under review on topics like biofabrication method and business model. We are preparing eight more patents this year on system components, bio ink, bio, bioprocessing system, and biomaterials. We work with great partners across sectors and countries, including Korea's top VCs and POSCO. Finally, if this presentation made you interested in joining our team, don't hesitate to contact us. We are always taking talented people in a range of fields, including but not limited to biotechnology, food science and technology, biomaterials, uh, system development, business strategy, sales and marketing. If you are interested in this up and coming industry and want to do something very interesting and rewarding, you will like it. We would appreciate if you email us your CV or resume and tell us about your areas of expertise and experience. Tisan Biofarm is on a mission to create the future by making sustainable future food with great technologies. If you have any questions, you can also email me at yjla at tisanbiofarm.com. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you, Ms. La, for the inspiring presentation. And upcoming next is going to be Simple Planet, Ms. Angela Hong for the next presentation. So Simple Planet has, is producing cultured meat, which has similar composition with the fatty acids with the actual meat. So we will go ahead with the presentation. Thank you. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Angela Hong, DPD Manager at Simple Planet in South Korea, focusing on cultivated meat. It's an honor to be invited in this webinar to share about who we are and what we do. 
As the issue of environmental solution has become an international social issue, EST management for sustainability has become a trend in the food industry. Alternative protein is a future food that will save the earth and future generation. Therefore, we focus on developing cultivated meat. With our cultivated meat, we expect a reduction in greenhouse gas emission, water usage, land usage, and most importantly, saving animals from slaughtering. We are a food tech startup specializing in cell line development, producing sustainable future food based on cell culture platform and stem cells. Detailed information about cell culture platform and stem cells will be explained later in this presentation. We were founded in 2021 by our CEO Il Du Zhang with two other professors. They were interested and studied, started studies on cultivated meat about five years ago. As you could see, this is the basic process for developing cultivated meat. In the process, our strong point is having cell line development and mass production technology. Currently, we have four different core technologies starting from having sources. We have nine types of cell lines that can be applied as raw material to produce cultivated meat. Second, we have bioreactor technology for mass production. We're able to produce mass amount with the cells we have made. For mass production, we use commercialized bioreactor for this. And at this point, we're collaborating with Thermo Fisher for mass production. Third technology is having engineering which can produce media for cultivated meat. This can dramatically reduce the cost for production by 90%. Last technology is the tissue engineering. When you think of cultivated meat, you might think of the real meat cuts, but the current, with current technologies, it is difficult to produce the whole cuts of whole beef. But one of the technologies Simple Planet has is the human organoid formation technology. Using this, our goal is to make real meat in the future. These are the actual pictures of our nine cell lines developed from beef, pork, chicken, duck, and fish. Using our cell lines, one of our accomplishments is the protein powder made from animal dried protein. When we compared our cultivated muscle to real muscle tissue, we found similar substances. Since we were able to check that substances were similar, we are certain that this can replace real meat. These are the products using our cultivated proteins. We made hybrid culture steak and dumpling, but the taste is the limitation. Meats cultivated with high concentration of muscle cell can lack texture, taste, and flavor, which is the same limitation that can be found in alternative protein. We have compared the beef cuts and of course the cut, which had more fats but less protein had higher percentage in taste, softness, juiciness, and so on. If we raise the percentage of fats by 30 to 40%, the taste of the meat will increase dramatically. Therefore, after troubleshooting, we're now mainly focusing on producing hybrid meat made from animal dried fat. By isolating adipose stem cells taken from bovine tissue, we were able to cultivate them to create a fat product. It contains the same composition as regular bovine fat with oleic acid, a healthy unsaturated fatty acid. Using this in place of unhealthy fats allows for future cultivated meat developments to be further tweaked to enhance nutritional profiles alongside taste and aesthetics. Our main goal is to develop product using fat cells to improve the taste. Starting from the left side, our first target is the meatball. If you ever tasted alternative, alternative protein meatball, you could tell it lacks some taste. Therefore, we have used our cell in the alternative protein meatball. We increase the fatty acid concentration, which can improve the taste. We believe that by adding 40% of our fat, our product will taste the same as real beef. Second on the right up corner, the alternative protein product that are commercialized at this point contains 50 grams of protein. By adding our protein, it can enhance the protein amount. Examples are silver, silver food. Seniors who have difficulties with chewing can intake same amount of food, but with high protein and, and calories. Lastly is the hamburger patty. 
Current alternative protein powder itself cannot satisfy the taste and juiciness of real meat. They're added with other additives to enhance the flavor, which has high sodium. Instead, by adding more fat, which can increase the taste, where we plan on substituting additives with our fat to enhance taste and reduce sodium. Our final goal is to use IPSC to make real meat. IPSC are cells that are scientifically developed, which has similar characteristics as embryonic stem cells. By making micro tissue with IPSC, we can differentiate cells such as adipose, myoblast, and blood vessel inside micro tissue similar to embryo. Using this engineering, we plan on making real meat in 3D structure. Currently, we have six registered patents and three applied about cultivating meat production. Our accomplishments were done by our researchers and strong team members, starting from our CEO, Il Dujang. Our CEO, Dong Han, has a long experience in drug approvals, and he mainly focuses on approvals for cultivated meat. Our CTO, Hio Park, is currently a professor at Hanyang University, and he is responsible for IPSC research. Lastly, Ki Hyun Yu, who has a long experience as a professor at Mayo Clinic, is a CTO of Simple Planet, and he's in charge of stem cell and organoid formation research. Having strong team members are our strong, strong points. Based on our study, we will continue to research and develop for sustainable future food, share core technologies and values through active collaboration and secure market competitiveness with a differentiated system. If you have more questions, you can contact me through email on the bottom below. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Ms. Angela Hong, for the interesting presentation. And I see a few questions on the Q&A and the chat. So if there are any questions for Tissom Biofarm and Simple Planet, please leave on the questions. And we will wrap up the session two with C with, with Dr. Okjegu. See with is an algae derived scaffold and culture media inventing company. So, Mr. Okjeku, the floor is all yours. Please proceed. Hi. Good morning to Europe and a good afternoon for the Russian friends. Yeah. My name is Okje and I'm a CEO of the company Seaweed. Oops. Because my company name is seaweed because everyone asked me that uh, we are doing the seafood or something, but uh, unfortunately we are Korean based the cultivated meat company, particularly we are culturing the beef cells, so we are trying to make the cultivated beef, but we are using the seaweed as a cell culture scaffold and the serum free media supplement. So basically the, the technology to produce the cultivated meat is quite simple, but uh, each company using very innovative technology like a TSM Biofarm using the 3D fabrication technology and uh, the simple planning using those IPSC cells or the stem cell to make the, the very special the, the fat. However, in, in, in case of the seaweed, we are using the seaweed as our main technology to producing our the cultivated meat. The seaweed is a, is a kind of the plant living under the water. And maybe you already know that it is growing really fast because uh, seaweed is also kind of a plant. If it, it's growing, it consumes a lot of the carbon dioxide. That's why we try to plant in the trees to reduce the carbon dioxide level in the world. But uh, the seaweed is growing much faster than the, the land-based plant. It actually consumes more carbon dioxide. So if we plant more seaweed, cultivate them, it will reduce the tremendous amount of the carbon dioxide from the air. And it is growing fast. It is also very the cost efficiently to produce. So if we using the seaweed as a, some ingredient, we can get it the really low cost. And traditionally, especially in Korea and other Asian area, we ate the seaweed for a long time. So it is already proven edible and very safe. 
the Korea has a very interesting food culture. The three sides of the Korea is actually surrounded by the sea. So we have a lot of the seafood derived food and we also eat a lot of the, the seaweed as a food. So especially the when in, in Korea, if, if woman gave a birth, we give the like, tremendous amount of the seaweed soup to the mother because we believe that the seaweed, seaweed has a lot of the the, the nutrient and it will help the recovery of the mother's health. So we eat a lot of seafood. So we already have the really, really big, the bioreactor for the seaweed. So if we want to using the seaweed, we can get really cheap and the really large amount of seaweed from the, our, the seaweed farmer. So actually the seaweed is co-founder, Hije and the Juno is actually born from the very Southern part of the Korea very near to the sea. The city name is Gijang, and Gijang is the one of the famous city in the Korea for producing the brown algae. The brown algae is called the miyok in Korea. And actually the miyok is the, the, the main ingredient for making the, the seaweed soup for the, the mother after the birth. So when our co-founders are uh, the literally born with the seaweed and the growing with the seaweed and they go to the university and they learn about the science and they are realized that uh, the seaweed is really helpful to solve the world the climate issue because it can consume a lot of the carbon dioxide so they are starting the business and uh, they are trying to make the business model to consume more seaweed and actually it is our one of the big mission and the vision of our company. So we trying many things and our co-founders have found out that if we using the seaweed, we can grow the animal cells on the surface of the seaweed. So we, we starting to produce the, the cultivated meat based on the, our the seaweed-based scaffold as the cultural materials. So this is the how we make the, our the scaffold system. We only using the inner mass of the our brown seaweed, and it is looks like uh, some sponge, and uh, we can find the many fiber structure inside of the, the seaweed. We collect them, and uh, we remove all the cell from the, the our seaweed is the and the make the scaffold using the material from the seaweed. And because it looks like a very fibrous structure, if we put the animal cell on them, it is uh, growing like a filament and make the muscle fiber like a structure and the differentiation. So this is the, our actual data and the, you can see that the, if we put the animal cell on the, our seaweed-based scaffold, proliferation is really good. And ultimately it will differentiate into the muscle cell fibers. So at the end of the, the left side, you can see the, the, the fiber, muscle fiber differentiated cell, like a uh, fiber structures. So another good thing about our scaffold system is uh, we, we can virtually make any shape out of our scaffold materials. So in case of us, we are trying to make the cultivate beef. So ultimate goal of our the development is making a stake like a structure. So we are currently using the cubic stake shape, the scaffold. However, we can shape them like a shrimp for the fish, or we even can make some shit like a structure. So we can use that as a, some scaffold system for the culture of the weather. On the other hand, we are also using the microalgae as a cell culture media supplement. So microalgae is another type of the seaweed. It's a single cell seaweed and it also has a lot of the nutrient inside. So if we make the extract from the microalgae, it contains a lot of the, the nutrient source or so vitamin, mineral, and even the fatty acid is uh, full in the microalgae extracts. So if we using the microalgae extract, it is definitely the, the replace the Tobobine serum from the animal cell culture media. So it is our the actual culture data. And then you can see that the our the microalgae extract based the culture medium is uh, almost the same 
as uh, the 10% FBS is uh, quite widely used as the cell culture medium. So summarizely, we are using the brown algae via as a cell culture scaffold, and we are using the microalgae, and we extract from the microalgae is using for the serum free media. And uh, we are currently also developing some the bioreactor system optimized for our scaffold. And actually, we are already doing some testing event in the May 2021. And this picture is actually showing our prototype. So as I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, our ultimate goal and the vision is uh, the culturally more seaweed because it, it we, we strongly believe that, believe that uh, cultivating seaweed is uh, so more absorb more carbon dioxide from the air and then it is the really helpful for the our climate issue. So we don't want to do by ourselves. So we are really open for the, the collaboration because if we collaborate with other company, we can make more careful than the culture media and uh, it will help the climate issues. So we are already collaborating with the other several other companies who are doing the chickens, pork fish or the, the shrimp, but uh, we are still opening for the other collaboration ships. So anyone interested in our technology and they try to our scaffold and the media, just to email me and then we can start some partnership. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Okjegu for the innovative speech. And this is a wrap up of session two. So great job for the three companies that have had the presentation today. So I will give the lead to Maria again for the question and answers. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Senjon. And thank you all of our speakers of Masterclass 2. It was really interesting to, to see the Korean landscape of culture meat. Uh, now we are going to run uh, the question and answer session. Uh, I don't know, Emma, if you are over there. Yes, I'm here. Okay. Maria, yes. Uh, so I have listed the questions for master class one uh, on the, the fermentation derived proteins um, and yeah we're a little bit over time but let's yep. just take the questions and the people quickly okay. time. yeah <laughs> can, can uh, stay on so uh, there were two questions for Avicom Stan I hope you're still there so one was uh, on what is the volume of production of the promic ingredient uh, so all the questions pertain actually to market readiness uh, which is uh, Understandable. Uh, Stan, you answered this in the chat, but do you want to quickly comment here as well? Yeah, of course I can comment. Eh? So we um, did um, test at demo scale phase at an um, at an, a potato processing factory in, in, in Belgium, eh? Agristo, uh, where we had a, a 50,000 liter fermenter unit to produce promic and to do all types of feed trials. Um, so that gave a couple of tons of product produced. At the moment, there is no full industrial uh, plant for, for Promic. We produce uh, batches of Promic at our, at our labs. Eh? So small scale production, yes. But of course, we are actively looking for partners in Europe or Asia yeah, to build the first full scale plants. That is a bit the idea. All right, that's fully clear, Stan, thanks. There was a second, uh, more specific question for you. Uh, and I think you didn't answer it yet in the chat. So how can the promic uh, ingredient enhance the viability of shrimp infection by Vibrio? I don't know if you have seen that question. I have seen that question. I answered to the, the person uh, in person. Yeah, directly, uh, yes. But the idea behind is that uh, we believe that when you use uh, microbial biomass as a protein source, then you do not uh, give uh, the animal the amino acids as such, but you give the full cell. And that uh, is a bit, yeah, we see uh, in by, by doing those, those tests, uh, we see that, that that gives some immunostimulating effect. It's a bit like a uh, vaccination uh, of a fish or a shrimp. Uh, when you give a small dose of something, yeah, they give an, you get a response from the immune system. And we believe that with biomass fermentation, you combine a food ingredient, but also with that aspect, of course, if you dose the microbial proteins in the, in the final feed product in the right concentrations. Great, thanks, Stan. I don't know if there are any other questions uh, from the participants to Stan. Uh, if so, you can also speak up. Uh, I think many yeah, people can also like just switch on their camera, right? Not they really. They, they, no, have not really. Raise, no, no, they have to raise their hands yeah. and we can yeah. give the, the power to them. Yeah. 
but okay. I don't know. Do you have any other question for Masterclass One? Or okay. yes, sorry, I still have okay. like uh, a few questions. So one is for uh, Mike Ovation for uh, Dr. Yasha Sweeney, uh, also on market readiness. The question is, how have you managed to scale your solid state fermentation? Can you deliver to the market? Uh, yeah, uh, good question, Emma. Uh, so uh, we have scaled from uh, the bench scale to pilot scale at the moment, and the production uh, is in India. The facility is in India, and we are scaling at the rate of like 100 kilos per month capacity. And uh, we have plans to scale up to one ton uh, before June 2023. So we've uh designed our own fermenter to do so and uh, we are installing these fermenters here in india okay thanks very clear thank you uh, doctor good and then there was like uh, another question for hermes paleo um what is the status of the paleo technology what volumes do you already produce now and what is the aim in the next two years hermes are you still there yeah, I'm here, but that wasn't yes. a call. Could you just repeat the question? I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, so what is the status of the Paleo technology? What volumes do you already produce now? So it's a question on volumes again. And what is the aim in the next two years? Yeah, so the, the first question, of course, I, I cannot uh, disclose uh, the titers uh, that we have, but we are currently scaling up. So, of course, we, 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 we are already past the, the, the phase of proof of concept. It's a matter of uh, trying to produce it in larger volumes. So we are in that process uh, now. Uh, and the, the aim for the coming two years, so basically it's to, uh, of course, scale, uh, further scale up of the technology. Um, and uh, second, also to have uh, first regulatory approvals, and which will, will be challenging. Uh, our idea now is to go a bit in parallel. Um, uh, so, of course, you can use scientific data for different uh, regions, but we didn't decide yet on uh, where exactly will we start filing for, um, for market authorization, because that, that's a complicated question. Uh, the, the EU, of course, is, is the most obvious one for European startup. The problem is that in the EU, it takes the longest, so probably will not be uh, the European market is not going to be the, 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 the first uh, to, to, uh, to commercialize. We will start somewhere else. Yep. Okay, thanks, Hermes. Uh, fully clear. Uh, there was just one final question for you. Um, like someone from the audience was interested in the mammoth hymn yeah. and asked, is there a flavor taste difference between mammoth and uh, bovine, I think? Yeah, I answered that in the chat. So ah, uh, yes, <laughs> there is. So that's interesting. These different species, uh, myoglobin species, they, they, they have different characteristics. Uh, so indeed concerning aroma and taste, but also stability. So for instance, the, the mammoth uh, um, myoglobin is more stable, more resistant to auto-oxidation, which is of course interesting for the industry because you don't want meat to change color from red to brownish. And that will be the same for a plant-based alternative. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Hermes. I think uh, for Masterclass 1, that were the questions. Um, OK, so shall so... I continue with, with the question for uh, Masterclass 2? Yes, would be great. OK, we have a question for Thyssen Biofarm. I don't know if Misla is, all, is also around here. Is it still around here? Uh, here. OK, perfect. The question was about if it is feasible to produce meat with a healthier fat profile, and less saturated fat. Mm, yeah, I already answered in the chat, but um, yeah, we haven't tested in our lab, but it is theoretically possible to adjust the nutritional profile. Uh, we use various ingredients for our bioink, which become the main ingredient for our products. Uh, with this uh, various ingredient, we can control nutritional profile of our products, not only fat profile, but we can also add other micronutrients. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. And now I have a question for, I don't know, for any Korean uh, startup or, or maybe food police. The thing is, there is a European attendee that would like to, to know which is the definition of uh, pre-series A in South Korea, because uh, he thought it could be different from, from the European uh, point of view. I don't know if any of you can give you can give us some, some light here. 
or maybe food police. I don't know, Saint John, about the which is the average or, or the definition of the size of uh, pre-series A funding. Well, I am not sure about what the pre-series A is. So if anyone among the companies okay. could answer it, it would be very appreciated. There was an answer in the chat as well, Maria. Okay, so, I, I uh, haven't maybe, yeah, checked it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so maybe we can go through the through the last uh, question. It's again uh, uh, for the for all the startups in in Masterclass Two. It's about uh, the disadvantages of the the impact of this kind of meat uh, in the health because usually uh, this uh, red meat production is associated with with uh, less healthier uh, impact. So they would like to know if this cultivated um, uh, red meat is going to have a, again the same uh, the same consequences uh, can i answer that <laughs> yes of course <laughs> that would be great <laughs> yeah I, I, I think it's a very good question and uh and actually, it's a very difficult question, and I think that I'm I'm not an expert about the nutrition, but uh, as long as I understand the the red meat, they give the higher risk of the colon cancer because yeah. there's uh, some nitrous compound inside. So it it, it is a it's a component of the animal cell. So if we culturing the 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 animal cells and differentiate into the muscle fiber. I think that, actually I'm not testing it, but the, I think that the, the component inside is similar to the actual lead meat. However, at least if we cultivating the cells, we can modulate the, some. So we can modify cell. a little bit this. Yeah. this okay. okay, that would be yeah. a, a, a good so, sign. Yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, the at least better than the, controlling the the live livestock it is much easier and a good way to modulate in the cell culture okay thank you so much may i also say something uh, yeah that could be perfect yeah because i understand uh, i start my video uh, i understand of course the question uh, the the will it have the same uh, challenges as 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 uh, conventional meat um I think everything is about dose, right? Uh, it, it, with most things, it's like uh, well, healthy things. If it's healthy to to have a certain to, to go above a, th a certain uh, threshold, but when you go too much, it's uh, getting toxic. So of course, also for us, I mean, we 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 will, we will never say that you eat you should eat uh, twenty times more uh, of our protein compared to to uh, a, a, a normal sure. diet uh, now. However. Uh, again, about the bioavailable iron uh, in our protein. Uh, vegans and vegetarians are challenged uh, uh, having a, a, enough iron uh, in, in, in their body. So I think it's, it's a solution as long as you don't exaggerate. Yeah, okay. But thank you so much for, for your point of view. Um, now, I think uh, it's time to, to continue. Uh, just uh, as uh, Emma com commented at the beginning of the webinar, we expected this webinar to be just the first touch base or, uh, for all of you. So we think this is a good opportunity to start making contact with all key players in other ecosystems, for example, Korea or Singapore. Uh, we are offering you uh, the possibility to, to match make with them through our platform, the, the platform you already registered to attend this, uh, this session, the B2Match. And you can uh, uh, connect with, with all the speakers or, or all the participants just to have meeting with them. Uh, when uh, you can do it, if you have uh, previously booked your meetings in advance, you, we are going to have a matchmaking session right after this, uh, this webinar. But also, you will have the opportunity to book other meetings for other days during the whole year in a continuous matchmaking uh, we are offering through the B2Match. So I think this is everything from our side, Emma. Uh, I would like just to remind the audience that you, we are we are uh, holding this kind of 
uh, thematic webinars in a monthly basis. So our next webinar is going to be on personalized nutrition in March, but we are going to have uh, every single month one different thematic workshop. So please stay tuned. And from my side, I would like just to, to thank to thanks the, the audience to, for, remain, for remaining here the whole webinar and also to, to the speakers and to Food Police and Enterprise Singapore to, uh, for helping us in building this, this competitive agenda. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, everybody, and uh, see you in the next webinar. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank bye. you. Thanks. Thank you. Have a good day. Same to you. Bye bye.